Well, thank you everyone for coming out this morning. I know it's early and I know it's cold outside. So thank you all for coming out. So we're going to talk about hepatitis B and liver cancer today, as you all know. So I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of background. Very, very basic. What is hepatitis B? A very, very basic definition of it is that it's a virus. And it's a virus that can cause a, various, a very serious infection of the liver that can lead to liver cancer or liver failure. But what, what is really hepatitis B? Why is it important? Hepatitis B is a true global epidemic. Now, everyone in this room has probably heard about HIV, right? We all kind of know how HIV is spread. We all have a pretty good understanding of HIV. There are about 33 million people in the world with HIV. But there are 350 million people in the world living with chronic hepatitis B. And far fewer people know what chronic hepatitis B is. The scary thing is that without appropriate long-term medical management, one in four people with chronic hepatitis B will end up dying of liver disease, either of liver cancer or liver failure. And that's why it's so important to really spread the message and educate each other about what hepatitis B is and what liver cancer is. So hepatitis B is actually the leading cause of liver cancer around the world. It's not alcohol, it's not smoking, it's chronic hepatitis B infection. And every year it takes between half a million and a million lives around the world. So this map shows you which countries have hepatitis B, basically. Every country that is in green has a pretty significant amount of the population who is chronically infected with hepatitis B, meaning they have, people have lifelong infection with hepatitis B. So the countries in this light green, about 2% or more of their population has chronic hepatitis B. And the countries in dark green, like in Asia and Africa, over 8% of their population has chronic hepatitis B. And because Asia has such a dense population, 3 quarters of the world's population that has chronic hepatitis B lives in Asia. I think the important thing, though, to take away from this is a lot of the world is covered in green. It's a big problem around the world. And if you look at the countries that are in green, these are the same countries that have a lot of liver cancer. So every country that is in this dark blue has very high rates of liver cancer. So again, the countries in green are now the countries in dark blue. All right. So why is it a problem in the US? The US wasn't one of the green countries. But it actually is still a big problem in the US. 1.2 million people in the US have chronic hepatitis B infection. And it's actually a major health disparity in the US. We have a lot of Asian immigrants in this country, but not many doctors actually are fully aware of what chronic hepatitis is and even how to treat it. So even though Asians only make up 4% of the US population, we make up 50% of those who have the infection in this country. And many of that is because they have migrated from countries that are highly endemic. And in the next 10 years, 30,000 people in the US alone will die of liver cancer or liver failure from chronic hepatitis B. So this shows you the common cancers in the US. Okay, so in white men, these are the top 10 most common cancers. And you see things like lung cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. I'm sure these are cancers that you have all heard about and probably know something about, right? If you look at Asian men, liver cancer is number two. Liver cancer doesn't even show up in white men, but it shows up number two, as a lead, number two leading cause of death in Asian men. And that is because of chronic hepatitis B infection. Same thing if you just look at California statistics. You look at the top five most common cancers in males in California. Among white, Hispanic, black Americans, it's prostate, lung, colon cancer, things that we're all used to hearing about. Now look at the Asian population. Every single Asian population, liver cancer is among the top five cancers. So this is a huge problem among the Asian population. And that's because it's a silent problem. People aren't talking about it. People who have it don't know that they have it. 
One in 10 Asians actually has chronic hepatitis B compared to one in 1,000 Caucasian Americans. One in 10. So if you look around this room, you look down your row, someone in your row probably has chronic hepatitis B and doesn't know it. Actually, when we test people, we test the general population, two thirds of the people who tested positive had no idea that they had been walking around with it probably for their entire lives. And that's because, like I said, there are no symptoms. People sometimes think, well, maybe I would have yellow eyes, my skin would turn yellow, maybe I would have belly pain. And that's usually not the case. By the time people have symptoms, it's often very late in the disease. So early on, people look normal, they feel normal, they feel healthy. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I go to my doctor every, every year, I get blood tests, I must not have it. Well, the typical blood tests don't test for it. And even if you just test your liver function, that can often be normal in people who have chronic hepatitis B. So like I said, you know, in our, in our country, unfortunately, not all doctors are very aware of chronic hepatitis B. This is uh, the story of Dr. Mark Lin. He was actually born in Taiwan, but immigrated to the US at a very young age in his childhood. He was educated in the US, went to medical school in the US, and at some point uh, when he was in medical school, he learned about hepatitis B. He got tested and he realized he had hepatitis B. And he asked his professors, you know, I have hepatitis B, should I do anything about it? And then they said, no, you're healthy, you're a healthy carrier, don't worry about it. Well, one day, uh, Dr. Lin was sitting kind of at lunch, talking with his friend. He had very sharp abdominal pain, so sharp that he doubled over and fell out of his chair. He was rushed to the emergency room at the age of 30. They diagnosed him with an advanced liver cancer. Unfortunately, he died a year, a year later, not even a year later. Before he died, he said to the Asian Liver Center, please use my story to educate other people. If I, a doctor educated in the US, did not know how to take care of this and treat this, most people probably don't. So spread my story. Tell people to get tested early so they, they can do something about it. So early screening and prevention really is key. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So the first question, how do you get tested? What should you go to your doctor and ask for? Two simple blood tests. And um, we have brochures in the back so you can pick them up when you're done. But the names of the two blood tests are the hepatitis B surface antigen and the hepatitis B surface antibody. And even a lot of doctors have a hard time di diagnosing this because the blood tests are kind of confusing. The two names sound a lot alike, right? Hepatitis B surface something. So I want to teach you guys to interpret your own blood tests, OK? So the hepatitis B surface antigen is the test to tell you whether or not you have the infection. If you are hepatitis B surface antigen positive, you have the infection. Now, if you are hepatitis B surface antigen negative, that's where the second blood test is important. The hepatitis surface B antibody tells you whether or not you are protected against hepatitis B, whether or not you have immunity against it. So if you are surface antigen negative and surface antibody positive, that means your body has protection against the virus. Either you were vaccinated in the past or you got the infection and you cured it yourself. If you are hepatitis B surface antigen negative and antibody negative, that means you're not infected, but you're also not protected. So you should go get vaccinated to protect yourself. All right. So again, the hepatitis B surface antigen is a test to see if you have the infection or not. So who should be tested? Well, according to the Centers for Disease Control, a lot of people should be tested, OK? And the number one thing on the list is if you want to be tested, you should be tested. And there are a lot of other high-risk groups that they have listed, including pregnant women, uh, uh, kids born to mothers who have hepatitis B. And the one that I'm going to talk about a little bit is those who were born in another country. Remember I said a lot of the world, like in Asia and Africa, Eastern Europe, they're endemic with hepatitis B. If you came from that part of the world, then you should be tested. So again, this is the map from the Centers for Disease Control. 
in all the countries that they list in red, here, red, 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 these are high risk areas. So if you came from, or your family came from one of these areas, you should probably get tested for hepatitis B. The countries in, listed in this orange color, orange yellow color, these are intermediate risk areas. They have 2% or more uh, prevalence of hepatitis B. These are still areas where if you have family who came from there or you came from there, it's a good idea to get tested. So how do you know if you're infected? Well, it's important to know kind of how it's transmitted, right? Because some people think there's no way that I, I could be infected. I've never been exposed to it. Well, there are three ways that you can be exposed to it. There are three ways that hepatitis B gets transmitted. The first one is through birth. Most people don't realize this, but it can be passed from mother to child. And that, that's actually how the majority of the world got hepatitis B. Because the mother didn't know that she had hepatitis B, and when she gave birth, during that birthing process with all the exchange of fluids, she passed it on to her child. And her child didn't know that he or she got it because they were just a baby. And if a child is exposed to hepatitis B at the time of birth, they have up to a 90% chance of carrying that virus for the rest of their life. That's why it's very, very important to find mothers who are infected and to prevent that transmission. The other way you can get it is through direct contact with blood. So blood transfusions, uh, using dirty instruments. Uh, if you actually have an open wound and someone else has an open wound and they have hepatitis B and the two wounds touch, that's one way to transmit it. And then finally, from unprotected sex. Now, a lot of people have misconceptions about hepatitis B. Uh, a lot of Asians actually think you can get it from sharing food, and you cannot. So some people think you can get it from holding hands. That's not true. Kissing, no, that's fine. You do not get it from sharing food. You do not get it from sharing chopsticks. You do not get it through saliva. Um, and just you know, holding hands or talking to someone who has chronic hepatitis B, you can't get it from them that way. OK, it's three ways, birth, blood, or sex. And hepatitis B is actually 50 to 100 times more infectious than HIV. So how do you prevent it from getting it? Well, don't use dirty needles, dirty instruments, tattoos, um, dirty piercings. Don't share razors or toothbrushes with other people. And then be aware of the medical instruments. Make sure that they're sterile um, and from clean healthcare uh, environments and avoid unprotected sex. But actually, the best way to prevent transmission is through vaccination. Since 1986, we have actually had an effective vaccine against hepatitis B. The World Health Organization actually called it the first anti-cancer vaccine. So in three, sh three shots over the course of six months can protect you for life against getting the infection. So, what happens if you didn't get the vaccine? What happens if you come in contact with the virus? Well, a couple of things can happen. One, your body can fight the virus. Most adults can fight the virus, and they can fight it off. Um, some people get sick, and then they get better. Uh, or some people don't even know that the virus entered their system, and they can fight it off. But sometimes your body can lose the battle. And especially in babies and kids, they very often lose the battle. And what that means is most oftentimes they become chronically infected. They, it's also known as a hepatitis B carrier. And these are the people who are at risk for developing liver cancer and liver failure. So this is actually the picture of a liver of someone with hepatitis B. This big thing right here is a liver tumor. And this part here, as you see the liver is a little lumpy bumpy, that's what cirrhosis is. But just because you have chronic hepatitis B, that doesn't mean that you're doomed. There's actually a lot that you can do to protect your health. The first thing is every six months, go see your doctor. And you need to get two blood tests, the ALT and the AFP. The ALT test tells you if you have liver damage. And the AFP is a marker for liver cancer. And then once a year, you need to get some form of imaging for liver cancer, either an ultrasound or a CAT scan. And if you find it early, the whole key is to find it early. Liver cancer is very treatable. 
Unfortunately, the survival rate for liver cancer in this country is less than 15%. The reason is not because we don't know how to treat it, it's because we always find it too late. So this is actually an ultrasound picture. This is from someone who knows that he had liver cancer and got liver cancer screening every six months and every year. This, this is ultrasound, this is the liver. So this light gray stuff is normal liver. These black parts are blood vessels and bile ducts. And there's a little area right here that's a little bit darker gray than the rest of the liver. That part right there turned out to be this liver tumor right here. But because this person caught it early, he got it removed through surgery, and he did fine. He lived, he didn't need chemotherapy, he did great. And this is what we want to do. We want to catch it early so that we can cut it out and you can move on with your life. Now, there's no cure for hepatitis B, but there is a lot of effective treatment. And the point of treatment is you want to reduce the risk to the liver. You want to reduce the amount of damage that is caused to the liver by the virus so you can reduce your risk of liver cancer and liver failure. Not everyone who has hepatitis B needs to be on treatment, and that's why you need to go see your doctor and talk to them. And if they decide that you need treatment, there are a lot of oral medications that are very easy to take. Most of them are once a day pills. Um, and a lot of times, especially in like the Asian newspapers, there are a lot of herbal medicines that are advertised to treat liver cancer or to treat hepatitis B. There is actually no FDA approved medications, herbal medications to treat hepatitis B. So be very, very careful because a lot of times herbal medicines can actually end up hurting the liver more. So what else should you do if you have hepatitis B? Well, the first thing is you have to get everyone in your family tested. If they don't already know whether or not they're infected or not, get everyone tested and vaccinate people who do not have the infection. And then protect your liver. So uh, don't drink alcohol. Uh, get the hepatitis A vaccine. You don't want any other infection or disease that could hurt the liver. So I've talked a lot about how to find the disease, how to, how to manage the disease. Uh, and sometimes it sounds a little scary, but I want you to hear the stories of some patients who actually ha who are living with hepatitis B, and it's really much more manageable than you think it is. I was first diagnosed in my early 20s. I was working for a high-tech company, and my a uh, coworker noticed that I looked tired and I had yellow in my eyes and my skin. And at the same time, around that time, my mom became involved in the hepatitis B awareness cause. And so I had some information about hepatitis B. I went straight to my family physician and had him test me. And the test did indeed come back positive. I kind of started to freak out a little bit because um, I knew the statistics and I told people every day that a million people die every year from it. And um, I read stories about 20-year-olds who get diagnosed with hepatitis B and then die before they hit 25 because of liver cancer. So I was first diagnosed in 1998 when I was donating blood. And I volunteered to donate blood. And a week or two later in the mail, I get a letter saying that they're not able to use my blood because I have the hepatitis B antigen in my, in my blood, so they won't be able to use it. I was first diagnosed with hepatitis B when I first got pregnant in 2004 with my first daughter. After I got off work, um, the same day that I got diagnosed, I um, of course called my parents first and told them. Um, I talked to my mom on the phone and um, told her what my, what my boss had told me, um, that I had hepatitis B and I explained to her what it meant because um, I don't think she really knew what it was or um, what it could do. So after I told her and told her that um, the most likely mode of transmission was between mother and child, um, she um, she started to apologize and said, um, "Sorry, like it's my fault, isn't it?" Um, and then I think she just felt really guilty for it. Um, so yeah, that was the hardest part. My mom 
has it. She's also a carrier, uh, as well as my siblings. And it's mostly because when she gave birth, she had no knowledge of the disease. I think it's great that in the United States, every mother who becomes pregnant is tested for hepatitis B because what better time to find out than when you have a possibility of transmitting it to your child. So if you know your hepatitis B, it's no big deal. All you have to do is make sure that you vaccinate your children. And you know, there's nothing else you have to think about after that. vaccine wasn't routinely given for um, babies at birth um, if their moms had hepatitis B. Um, so maybe if it had been um, required when I was born, I wouldn't have hepatitis B now. I didn't get the vaccine until um, three or four before I started kindergarten. I found out that I could protect my infant from hepatitis B by um, vaccinating. So right after he was born, he received the HBIG and then the Series 3 hepatitis B shot. My doctor told me to tell the hospital staff that I was a hep B carrier and to make sure that they remember that after I deliver the baby, that she gets two shots after birth within the 12 hours to protect her from getting hepatitis B. My daughter got the testing for hepatitis B. When I found out that my daughter wasn't a hepatitis B carrier, I was happy, relieved, and so, so blessed. It's really the last thing. Hepatitis B and my children having hepatitis B really is in the back of my mind. I never have to think about it because they've received the vaccinations and they've tested positive with the antibodies. So I know that I never have to think about them having hepatitis B. I was very relieved when I found out that there was a, a prevention for my children and that hepatitis B would stop with me. It was a relief for me to know that hepatitis B could stop right at me and didn't have to get passed on to my daughter. Knowing that it'll stop with me is just, I don't know, makes it kind of easy to live with. I think um, I feel that Having my children vaccinated gives me a sense of security, knowing that they will never contract hepatitis B and that I have protected them for life. Okay. So these women were educated by hepatitis B. They realized that it was manageable and that they could protect their families from it. And this is why the Asian Liver Center at Stanford is around, because we really want to educate people. We want to educate the public so that each of you can go out and say, hepatitis B will stop with me, and tell your friends and family about it. So the Asian Liver Center was founded in 1996 with the goal of educating the community, educating healthcare providers, to really end hepatitis B around the world. One of the things that we developed with the Jade was the Jade Ribbon Campaign. We actually designed our ribbon to look like the Chinese character for a person because we wanted people to realize that this is really a campaign to bring people together so that we can protect each other. And we made the color jade because in Asian culture, jade means prosperity and luck. It means all things good. And this is it's kind of the spirit of the campaign. We want people to come together and help each other live happy, healthy lives. So what can you do? Well, the first thing we want you to do is to be tested. And if you don't have uh, hepatitis B, to get vaccinated. If you do have hepatitis B, then get treatment, get checked for liver cancer, and then join the fight. Go out and spread the message about the Jade Ribbon Campaign. A lot of people think, you know, it's okay. The doctors are gonna do it for me. I'm gonna go to the doctors. They'll tell me if I need to get tested or not, and they'll go and educate their patients. Well, um, some time ago, we actually did a survey looking at well, how much do doctors know? And we asked them five very basic questions. You know, do they know that hepatitis B has no symptoms? Do they know that one in 10 Asians actually has chronic hepatitis B? Did the doctors know that if 
a child got it as a newborn, they had a 90% chance of having the disease for the rest of their life. Do the doctors know what happens if you have chronic hepatitis B and that one in four people die for the, from the disease? And this is the percentage of doctors that answered each of these questions right. For some questions, only 26, 33%, and 22% of doctors got those questions right. We asked the same questions to nurses, and they didn't do much better. 23%, 10%, 17%, 37% got it right. We even asked the same question to 100 Asian high school students who were interested in go going into medicine to become doctors. And guess what? The high school students overall did better than the doctors and nurses did. So the important thing is educate yourself. Go out and educate your community. Don't rely on someone else to tell you what to do. Now, when you step outside today, we have brochures in every imaginable Asian language. And we actually send these out all over the world. In 2007, we sent out over a million brochures at no cost to the people requesting them. Some were requesting as far away as India and Pakistan, and we shipped them overseas. We didn't even ask them to pay for shipping. So grab the brochures, give them to your friends and family, help us spread the word. So we want you to join in the fight. And we've already recruited people to help us. But most don't know because they don't have any symptom. But there are ways to prevent and treat it. See a doctor who will test you for hepatitis B. So join me and the J Ribbon campaign. If Yan can fight hepatitis B, so can you. <laughs> All right, so let's hear. Are you guys ready to fight? OK, so let's see how much you learned during this talk. What does chronic hepatitis B actually lead to? Cancer, liver cancer, and death. Liver, liver cancer. Yeah, right, liver problems. So cirrhosis, premature death, liver failure, liver cancer. Good. So that's a liver tumor, and that is a liver that's, like I said, very lumpy, bumpy. That's cirrhosis. Good. One in how many Asians has chronic hepatitis B? Ten. One in ten. Ten. One in ten Asians has chronic hepatitis B compared to one in 1,000 Caucasian Americans. What are the signs and symptoms of most people? No, no, we don't have them. Exactly. No symptoms. That's why it's so important to get tested, even if you feel well. And how many people, one in how many people die of this disease? Four. One in four. Twenty-five percent die of this disease if they don't get treatment. And is there a cure? Yes. No. 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 No cure right now, but there is treatment, exactly. We can manage it, and we can control it, and that's the goal. And how is hepatitis B transmitted? Is it from mother to child? Yes. yes. Is it from blood? Yes. Good. Is it from unprotected sex? Yes. Yes, it is. Is it from dirty food and water? No. 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 Good. Is it from shaking hands? No. Good. And how do you protect yourself? get tested, and get vaccinated. So good, you guys learned your lesson. OK, so I have one last message for you all. Great. That's it. Do you all have questions? Is he, if you have ALT and AST normal with a limit, then how will you detect hepatitis B? So you, I think you probably walked in late. Can you repeat the question? So the question is, if you have a normal AST and a normal ALT, how can you detect hepatitis B? So for those of you who don't know what AST and ALT are, those are liver function tests. That is not the way to screen for hepatitis B. So the way we check are for, by two tests. Does anyone in the audience remember what those two tests are called? 
Great, so hepatitis B surface antigen and the hepatitis B surface antibody. Those are the two tests you need to get to see if you have it. If the surface antigen is positive, that means you have hepatitis B. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yes? Um, so the antigen is in the blood. Mm -hmm. How come it didn't get to the saliva or semen or vaginal secretions or milk? So it is actually passed through sex. So it, it can be in semen, but it is undetectable in other mucosal secretions like saliva. And so that's why it's not spread through kissing. It's an undetectably small level. Um, probably none. People debate whether or not there is any present in, but um, it is not spread through saliva. The Centers for Disease Control say that it's not spread through saliva. Uh, the World Health Organization said it's not spread through saliva. But it's more in the semen. It is in semen and it's in blood. It's in high concentrations in those two bodily fluids. In the back? I asked my doctor for an antibody uh, a, a, a blood test. He said, I don't need it. Now, can antibody disappear? So that's a good question. You actually raised two really good points. The first point is you were correct in asking for the antibody blood test. The reason is a couple of things. The, the, it's not so much that the antibodies disappear. Sometimes we don't detect it in blood anymore, but it's felt that you still have protection. And at this time, it's not recommended to get booster doses. So for example, if, you're, if a child got vaccinated in childhood, when they're 30 or 40 years old, they don't need to get another shot, even if they can't see it in their blood. But more importantly, a lot of adults go in and they get the vaccine. And in adults, sometimes it takes more than just three shots. So after you take your three shots, you should go get tested to make sure that it worked in you and that you have antibodies. And if it didn't, then you go get another shot. And then you wait a few weeks and then you test again. So for example, in my case, I got it as a teenager and after three shots, it didn't actually work. So I had to get tested and then I got another shot and then it worked. So it's important to check the antibodies. Yes? You mentioned that you're infected through the mother. My father died of liver cancer mm -hmm. at age 64, mm -hmm. and then in utero, could the virus have gone to my mother and then to me? Can you repeat this question? Sure. So the question is, her father died of hepatitis B and liver cancer. Could she have gotten it in utero from her mother? The, the, um, uh, the understanding of the virus is that uh, if the virus is passed to your mother, it was passed from your father to your mother, either from close contact or from sexual contact, and passed to you during the birthing process. It is really not felt that in utero um, children get it, but it's actually during the actual birthing process, as children are coming out of the birth canal, during that exchange of fluids between mother and child, that's when the virus is actually passed. Are there liver transplants nowadays? Yes, so this is one of the common reasons why we actually do liver transplants, is for people who have hepatitis B who then develop liver failure or liver cancer, and they can get a liver transplant. So very small liver tumors from hepatitis B can actually just be cut out of the liver, and the liver actually regrows back to its functional size. Um, and if you have such a large tumor that uh, you can't simply cut it out, there are other treatments, and transplant is certainly one of them. Yes? You see, sometimes these virals are not active. So how much time it takes to actually, for example, in one case, it was about 20, 40,000 viral load, and it was not active for the last 40 years, and suddenly it went up and it started active and became 900,000. So is it possible? So um, th this is a slightly more complicated question. This is why people who have, so sorry, the question is, how do you know if a virus is going to become active? If you have a viral load of a certain amount and then over a period of time later it grows into the millions. What do you do about that? How do you know? Blood right, blood, blood test. So you can get a blood test to check how many virus particles are in your blood. It's a complicated question because we don't look at virus particles alone to decide on treatment. You look at liver function tests, you look at other things as well. So uh, there are different markers to see 
if certain viruses are going to be more active than others, and other times you simply don't know, which is why it is so important that every six months you go in and you get an ALT and you get an AFP. And if any of those start to become abnormal, that means that the virus is starting to do harm on the liver. And that's when more testing is indicated. And then that's when you have the discussion with your doctor whether or not you need to start treatment. There's a question here. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, if uh, we have a uh, hepatitis B body anti antigen positive, does it mean that we don't have uh, liver cancer in the future because we are protected? If you are hepatitis B antibody positive, so let me find that slide for you so we, we all know what you're talking about. The question is, if you're a hepatitis B antibody positive, does that mean you won't have liver cancer in the future? Is that your question? Yes. Okay, let's find that slide for you. So we can go back and review it. Let me actually find the slide. Okay, I know that this is complicated because the two words sound so much alike. If you are surface antibody positive and you are surface antigen negative, you are protected from life. You are not at risk for liver cancer from hepatitis B. Okay? Of course, if you drink yourself to death, you are still at risk for liver disease, but at least not from hepatitis B causing it. No. You, you cannot, so in, sorry, the question was, if this is your blood test status, can you infect someone else? And the answer is no. Sorry, go ahead. My question is, <clears throat> if you have had hepatitis, how long will it take be felt before you develop liver cancer? And also, if that period is, <clears throat> very long, can I assume you are not going to get liver cancer? So the question is, how long does it take to develop liver cancer if you have hepatitis B? And no, it, I'm not talking about liver, hepatitis B. I have to know whether it's hepatitis A or hepatitis B. That's the reason why I asked you this question. So hepatitis A is, does not cause liver cancer. Okay. So after a long time, I don't develop liver cancer. Can I assume it was hepatitis A instead of hepatitis B? So it sounds like the question is, you, someone told you at some point in your life that you had hepatitis, but you don't know what hepatitis it is, yes. and you want to know whether or not you're at risk for liver cancer? Yeah. OK. That's the reason why I'm asking yeah. you, how long will it take? before a person develop liver cancer. So in a person who has hepatitis, chronic hepatitis B, it can take as little as 20 years. It could take as long as a lifetime, and a person never develops liver cancer. You don't know. And you don't know how it'll behave in you. So in a way, because you don't know if you had hepatitis B or not, or if you had hepatitis A, which is an entirely different virus, you're sort of taking a gamble by waiting to see if you develop liver cancer. So what you should do is go get these two tests that we're talking about and just get the answer for yourself. If you're hepatitis B antigen negative, you will not get liver cancer from this cause. OK? So just be, if you, for example, say you're 60 years old and you think you might have hepatitis, you're not sure, and you don't have liver cancer. That doesn't mean that you won't get it when you're 61 years old, or 62 years old, or 80 years old. There's no way to predict that. The best thing to do is to get tested for hepatitis B. Okay. Let's put the question in a different way. I have had hepatitis. I'm not sure whether it's A or B. I was here in this country for almost 40 years, mm -hmm. and I have had my blood test done every year or every six months, depending upon 
my problem. Mm -hmm. If I don't develop this liver cancer after 40 years, may I assume that that hepatitis is hepatitis A, or is it wrong to assume that? The reason I'm asking you this is, I have my health insurance is at Palo Alto Clinic. They have good doctors there. I mentioned about my case, and I never have had this test that you just mentioned. Is it still necessary for me to go back and ask for the test that you just mentioned here? Yes. Regardless. Yes. Don't, it's very dangerous to make assumptions about your health. So if you have not had these two specific tests up here, bring the brochure to your doctor and ask your doctor to test you for these two things. Now one of the things that this gentleman brings up is hepatitis A. It's confusing because there's hepatitis A, there's hepatitis B, and there's hepatitis C. These are three different viruses. They're, you get these three different viruses in very different ways. Hepatitis A is from, is essentially food poisoning. Basically, if someone goes to the bathroom, they wipe their bottom, they don't wash their hands, and they prepare a salad for you, that is how you get hepatitis A. You get very, very sick, you get diarrhea, the majority of people recover, they get better, it's never a problem, they do not get liver cancer from hepatitis A. An extremely small percentage of the population can die from it, but that's because of that acute hepatitis A, essentially food poisoning. But hepatitis B is an entirely different animal. So um, the best way, again, to know is go get these two tests. If you have not gotten the hepatitis B surface antigen, you need to go ask for that very specific test. Uh-huh, sir? Uh, on the vaccination, uh, if the antigen is negative, is there any value or would it work to, have, to, be, to get vaccinated? So uh, if you don't, so the question is, if you don't have hepatitis B right now, if you are surface antigen negative, should you go out and get tested? I mean, get vaccinated? Well, I think that's obvious because the third one, you obviously saying if both are negative, you can't get right. vaccinated. But what if the antigen is negative, but the antibody is positive? So if the antibody is positive, that means you're protected. You don't need it. You already have the antibodies. Vaccine will not add any additional protection. Yes, sir. Now, what if your antibody uh, is no longer detectable, whereas a long time ago it was? What's your course of action? According to my doctor, you don't need to do anything. And that is the current recommendation. There are very few exceptions, unless you're on hemodialysis. Right now, you don't need to do anything. So if I have no antibody detectable, I do not need to boost it. Because, what you're saying? because you have had antibodies in the past. Yes. So the, the current understanding of the vaccination and the disease is that you have antibodies in your system that are dormant and that if you get re-exposed to the virus, you will have protection. Yes? BDC carrier, it's okay to get an A vaccine or yes. not too late to get an A vaccine? Correct. If you have hepatitis B, you should go out and get the hepatitis A vaccine because if you get hepatitis A, that can hurt your liver more. Yes? You mentioned uh, you have one of brochures. Mm -hmm. It's paper. Uh, electronically, what's the best way yes. for me to uh, send information to my children? So if you go to our website, liver.stanford.edu, so liver, like the organ, .stanford.edu, we have all of our brochures in every language posted online, including um, a manual that's to guide doctors. All of the things that we publish that we share with organizations like the Centers for Disease Control are all online and free for you to access and send to your families. Yes? I got high school about a year ago, and they had a Jade Ribbon Club run by some Yes, they did. And then I had an article that I've been passing out for the last 15 years, I think it's 15 years, by Dr. Samuel So mm -hmm. on highlighting this issue. Yes. So that's been helpful. 
Yeah, so Dr. So is uh, a liver surgeon who founded the Asian Liver Center in 1996. And uh, among the things that we've done in the community to kind of get community awareness, we've actually worked with high school students. And in the high schools around this area, over 30 high schools have individual clubs where the high school students get together and they figure out ways to improve awareness in their own community. They go to their cities, they go educate their city councils, they have jade ribbon days. The, the high school students are incredibly active. We're very, very proud of their accomplishments in the community. So that's great that they were very active at GUN. Yes? Could you have HP service antigen positive and HP service an antibody positive? Yes. On occasion, you do have both surface antigen positive and surface antibody positive. Those are rare instances. The first thing you should do is just go get retested. If you still have both, you're, you're treated as someone who is just surface antigen positive. Uh -huh. Everybody has half A, one time or another, correct? Not really. Okay. So once you have Hep A, you have antibodies. Yes. Then you don't need a vaccine. Correct. If you've already had hepatitis A, you do not need the vaccine. All right. Oh, one more. Yeah. If you're having a treatment, um, they have some medication on there. Yeah. Um, if you're on a treatment, would you still get liver cancer? The treatment is felt, felt to reduce your risk of liver cancer, but you cannot eliminate your risk of liver cancer. But if you're on treatment, you're getting frequent monitoring, and you're getting very close follow-up. And so even if you develop liver cancer, the goal is that you catch it early. And if you catch it early, um, as I said, it's very, very treatable. I know the Hopkins Rubens had tested two mutations that leading to liver cancer. Mm -hmm. Why don't you use that to screen out that 25 percent Asians? Uh, it's not perfect right now. There are a lot of different mutations that people are testing. There are different mutations depending on which part of the world that you come from. So if we only test those mutations, we would probably end up missing a lot of people. So right now, that's not an, a widely accepted means of screening for liver cancer. Sorry, you okay. I, I heard my friend say that most homeless got hepatitis C. So let's say that's not a biased opinion, but what is the reason behind most homeless got hepatitis, hepatitis B, a C? I, I, um, so the question is, um, essentially, why do certain people have hepatitis C versus not? Hepatitis C is uh, very different than hepatitis B. It is most commonly transmitted through dirty needles, um, tattoo needles, uh, IV drug use, uh, and uh, blood transfusions. Um, many, many, many years ago in our country, uh, our blood supply was not as clean as, is, as it is today, and many people got hepatitis C that way as well. Which one is worse? <laughs> <laughs> I can't prioritize diseases. They're all concerning, and they all deserve close follow-up. Yes, in the back. Chronic hepatitis B is curable? I'm sorry? Chronic hepatitis B is curable? It is not curable. It is not curable. And how to protect other family members, like children and children? How do you protect other family members? Vaccination. Vaccination. Only vaccination, otherwise you don't have any precaution. No. Vaccination is incredibly effective and is very simple. So that's the best thing that we have. And, uh, you know, you can, of course, avoid sharing razors, af avoid sharing tooth toothbrushes, things that might have blood on them. But the most important way is just vaccinate your family members. Okay, Ruth? If you have um, hepatitis B, is it viable to still get a vaccine? Would that do any benefit to you? Unfortunately, if you already have hepatitis B, the vaccine will not add anything. It won't hurt you, but it won't add any benefit either. Mm -hmm. Back in the 70s, my dad was treated at UCLA with Dr. Fred Eilber, and at that time, they used a pump to the hepatic artery to the liver to uh, directly uh, give the cancer drug. 
it gave them three months, but is that still used nowadays to better uh, um, You're talking about hepatic artery infusion. That's uh, not done widely these days anymore. Very, very select instances, and not necessarily for the kind of liver cancer I'm talking about. Sometimes it's used for metastases, but that's a very small set, not, not done very commonly at all anymore. Uh -huh. The latest one, uh, using gene therapy to block the three uncoded RNA on the B viruses, how's that work out so far? And what's your opinion on that? Can you repeat that question? So I think... The gene therapy to block the three or four sites on the unprotected RNA on the B viruses in order to completely cure. Right. I think this gentleman here is more familiar with the microbiology of hepatitis B than I am. I have no opinion on it. So I, I think it's very experimental. There are, there's a lot of research on the various genotypes of hepatitis B um, going on. And all of it is it's very promising. But right now, none of that is in clinical practice. And I, I, I actually don't know about that one. So I don't have an opinion on it. Yes, sir. Yeah, does uh, having chronic hepatitis B increase cancers of, of other kinds other than liver? Uh, at this point, uh, so the question is, does chronic hepatitis B increase cancers of other types other than liver cancer? At this point, it's not felt significantly so. Hepatitis B can cause other problems with the body, like in the kidneys, but uh, can, and as far as cancer risk goes, it's predominantly liver cancer. Yes. Yeah. Is there any kind of special diet for hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis B? Is, so the question is, is there a diet for chronic hepatitis B? If you have chronic hepatitis B, don't do anything that hurts your liver. So don't drink alcohol. Even a little bit of alcohol can hurt the liver if you already have chronic hepatitis B. Don't take excessive amounts of Tylenol. Um, and ask your doctor about medications that can potentially harm the liver. But beyond that, you know, I think it, the same rule applies to all of life, life, which is to eat a healthy diet, eat a lot of fiber, and go out and get exercise. All right, great. Well, yes. What do you think about the idea that using uh, reverse transcriptase to slow down the viruses, and then using the PEP interference to modify your immune system so that you gradually, the stem cell replacing the bad cells, and that way you got a complete cure. What do you think about that? In terms of three years. I think that is a very interesting concept. I don't think that that's going to be clinically relevant in the next three or five years that I'm aware of. Um, I think that there are, like I said, a lot of these um, exciting developments, but they're still pretty far from being applicable to patient care. All right, thank you everyone.